Okay, hello. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, hello, I'm Tommy, so thanks for being here. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know 50% I've seen the faces before, but most of you are just new people. That's really nice. That's great. Uh, today, I think that's the most important discussion we're going to have like, so far. No pressure, um, eh? Yeah, and uh, the German right here. He is amazing, very knowledgeable. Um, if you don't know what this is all about, the Darker Music Talks is a thing that's happening every month, and it's an informal discussion, okay? So it's not a panel, it's not, I'm a musician myself, it's not here like people looking good or people feeling proud about being in the industry. It's about real people that want to have discussions and learn stuff. It's about knowledge, okay? And this is why it's for free. Because for me as a musician, I've seen musicians, other people like me struggling, because they don't know where to go, where to get knowledge, where things are going. So it's why we bring people that have loads of knowledge and have been doing this for years to come here and explain us a few things and then it's your turn, you ask questions and we have a discussion going. So I've seen if you give people the opportunity to ask more knowledgeable people like questions, then other people jump in and people start feeling like, okay, there's good energy, I'll ask a question as well. So what, this is what it's all about, an informal discussion, organized formally. It happens every month, so if it's the first time for you here, you're going to receive like an email next month in October about the next discussion. You can watch what happened before on my website. I have videos with everything. These lovely people here make sure that everything looks nice on the website. Um, and I'm Tommy. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank London Fusion Basically, they provide, they facilitate the event, and also they run a few interesting things you might be interested in. If you can come over and be really, really quick. This is Andre. Hey, Andre. <laughs> 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 I was expecting that. Um, I'll make this really brief, so I think you'll listen to this man here. Um, London Creative and Digital Fusion is, we're basically a partnership of five universities from across London, and what we do is we help creative and digital companies to grow, make more money, expand, achieve their business goals, whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do. And um, we've got various things and means we use to do that. Workshops, one-to-one uh, -one assistance, um, we've got some funding as well. Right, can I hear you? Can Switch it off. It's off. Um, we do workshops, we do one-to-one um, -one assistance, whatever it is your business needs to move forward. And as musicians, you do have to be thinking of yourselves as businesses. I'm not sure if all of you are, and if you're not, you need to start doing that because, as we all know, the industry is changing so much now that it's impossible to eat if you're not thinking of yourself in a business-like way. So, um, anyone wants to talk to me afterwards, and I can spell out exactly how we can help. And, um, yeah, we've got lots of information at the front as well, which you can grab. Thanks for coming. Hand you over to James here. Thank you. So again, this is quite informal. Feel like home, do whatever you want, scream, <laughs> behave badly. If you wanna, if you don't wanna pay attention to Jay and wanna tweet, this is what you need to use, okay? So other people can see what's happening. Dark and music talks, and yeah, let's, let's start. <laughs> Good evening, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for providing this fantastic facility. I agree with Tommy, yeah, that's being formal, but I've got the mic. <laughs> My name's Jay Stapley, spelled S-T-A-P-L-E-Y, like a stapler, but with a Y on the end. <laughs> a couple of things you should know about me. First is that I hate PowerPoint, and I will not subject you to death by PowerPoint when I say exactly what's on the screen and you sit there going... Why am I bothering? Why didn't you just send me the PowerPoint presentation? Second is that I take a great deal of care with my opening lines for these presentations. But tonight I'm going to actually do something quite radical and embed an opening line from a previous presentation as my opening line for this one because it's relevant. Some months ago I was asked to do a short gig and then a discussion for a pharmaceuticals company for their annual sales meeting. And I thought, what the hell do I know about pharmaceuticals? 
And then I thought, you know what, as a practicing musician in the rock business through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and noughties, I actually know a little bit more about pharmaceuticals than I might have <laughs> But maybe coming at it from a different angle to the executives that were sitting in front of me, I'm talking about headache pills and hangover cures. <laughs> Just say no, kids. I'm in a similar situation here tonight. I am not a businessman. My accountant will attest to that. I'm not a business guru. I've never worked for a major record label as an employee. I've been signed to a major record label. I've worked as a musician and producer with artists who signed to major record labels. And I've started my own micro label. I've never been employed by a publisher. I've been signed to a publisher, and I've worked with artists who are signed to publishers. I've started my own micro-publishing company. I've never worked for a live promoter or a booking agent. I've done gigs from wine bars to football stadiums and worked with promoters and booking agents from the highest levels down to the people who have the nerve to call themselves promoters on the gig scene that maybe many of you work on where they insist that you actually do the promotion. The only possible answer to them is, yeah, great, how many songs are you going to sing? That's your only reasonable response, in my opinion. So I've done all those things, and I'm kind of in a similar position to you in that I'm now, slightly late in life, starting a career as a solo artist. I've been a hired gun all my life. I've been a session musician. I'm now looking at a career as a solo artist, along with all the other kind of stuff I do. So I'm actually in a similar position to you. And I'm certainly not going to hit, sit here and talk at you for an hour and a bit. I'd like to hear what you have to say, because I don't know. Now, that's a shocking thing to admit to a room full of people, okay? But I don't know any more than you do. What I have is the angle that I bring from my year's experience in the music business, and I've watched the way it changed. And the one thing I can tell you for sure is that by the time I finish writing this speech, it'll be out of date. It is changing so quickly and in ways that we can't really understand because we're involved in it and we're too close to it. I was talking to Alexandra earlier about technology. Technology goes in quantum leaps, right? Every now and again, there's a massive advance in technology. And then for the next 10 years, it's just sort of tweaking around the edges. And then there's a massive leap in technology. We're in a similar situation in the music business in that we're in a quantum leap period when everything's changing. So to understand a bit more about the music industry and the new business models that we're here to talk about, the first thing we've got to do is understand the music industry. When did the music industry begin? When did the music business start? You'll go. 1920s? Any advance? Publishing sheet music in the 1800s? People would pay to see opera in the 1600s. 1600s? As long as. And how long was that? As long as humankind has been around. So the music industry actually is as old as we are, actually. And if you want to define the music industry, I would say, tell me if you think this is fair. The music business is when a musician performs a musical act in return for goods, services, or currency. Fair? Okay. We can go back centuries, longer. We can look at the minstrel in the marketplace who turns up in the marketplace on market day and sings some songs with a hat in front of him and gets a few coins and maybe a spare duck. <laughs> or not, if he was a vegetarian minstrel. But that's his function. He then goes up to the squire's house. Your Honour, can I write a song for your ladyship's birthday? Can I perform at your banquet tonight? in return for which you get bed and board. It's the music business, right? But we all think the music business 
is about putting pieces of plastic in lorries and sending them around the world to people who then buy those pieces of plastic. How many of us think that getting signed to a major label is our aim in life as a musician? I, I kind of set up the question a little bit. <laughs> okay, let's put it another way. If you were offered a major label deal now, how many of you would take it? Okay. Depends on the contract. Depends on the contract. Okay. If you're a singer and a songwriter, then it's going to be you know publishing them. You might need to, you need to look at what the fine lines are. Indeed. The, the wisdom used to be that you didn't sign your publishing to the same company who signed your recording. That's not the way it happens anymore. And there are good reasons for it. Um, let me just get a handle on who, have we, who we've got in the room. How many of you are artists? Okay. How many of you are business people? How many of you have wandered in off the street attracted by the free coffee? <laughs> okay. okay. Is it worth reviewing how the traditional recording industry economics work? Because it's in the light of that that we can understand the new business models that have sprung up. Can I quickly depress you hugely? <laughs> My aim tonight is to depress, entertain, annoy, irritate, provoke. The economics of a major label deal were and are this. You sign a deal with a record company who lend you an advance. Let's give you a hundred grand. Yes! <laughs> Ferrari! Best champagne! Here we go. Hold on. They didn't give it to you, they lent it to you. Your manager takes 20%. You're down to 80k. Managers used to like to front load the deals. The bigger the advance you got, the more they got, regardless of whether or not you sell a record. Okay, 80 grand. This money is intended to help you make your record. It's intended to pay for you to make your record. How much is it going to cost you to make a record? You've hired a hotshot producer. You really liked his last record. The record company agree with you because he's had hits. He's going to charge you two grand a track. That's not uncommon for a top line producer. And the reason why he charges you a flat fee is because you, the band might break up when the record's finished and the record never gets released. But he's worked his socks off to make a record, so he's going to charge you two grand a track. You're going to do 12 tracks. Let's say you're going to do 15 and you've knocked him down to a deal and you're going to pay your producer 25 grand. You've got 55 grand. You're not looking so pleased anymore, are you? Maybe the Ferrari wasn't a good idea. Maybe a second-hand Nissan Micra and a couple of crates of Fosters might be more kind of where you're aiming. You've then got to hire the studio and book session musicians and make the record. 40 grand? It's not unrealistic. In the golden days of recording, you'd spend 100 grand making a record. Let's be generous, let's make it 35, shall we? You've got 20 grand. How many of you in the band? Four? Oh dear. Five grand. Do you know what the good news is? You won't pay any tax on it because you don't come into the income tax threshold. <laughs> <laughs> now then, the record company will make pieces of plastic with holes of varying sizes in the middle depending on whether you're released on vinyl or CD or whatever. That retails for ten pounds. I know. No, it doesn't. Tesco's knock them out for a fiver, three quid more like. Let's keep the figures simple. Let's say it retails at £10. You have a 10% royalty. How much do you get per record? A quid. 
Your record company will recoup your advance from your royalties before you see a penny. How many of those do you have to sell to recoup your advance? 100,000. That used to be easy. It's not anymore. People are having number one albums with 30,000 sales. You're never going to recoup. You don't stand a chance. Let me put this another way. I own a shoe factory. You've come to me for a job. I said, OK, yeah, I'll give you a job. I will lend you the money to buy the materials to make the shoes. I will then sell your first batch of shoes. And I will pay you a royalty on each pair of shoes that I sell. Not each pair that you make, each pair that I sell. And the first thing I'll do with the royalty that I, that I give to you for each pair that I sell will go to pay off the money that I lent you to make the shoes in the first place. And then I'll lend you more to make the next batch of shoes. Do you want the job? You've got five seconds to decide because there's 100,000 other people outside that door who will take the job. Yes or no? Five, four, three. <laughs> and yet you would dash to sign a major label deal. Doesn't make any sense. Let's just look at an alternative method, which is the self release and self finance method. You make a record yourself. We'll come back to how much you spend on it in a minute. You sell it for a tenner. How much do you keep per record? <laughs> Ten quid. Let's say you only spend 15 grand on making it. We'll come back to that in a minute. How many of those do you have to sell to make 100 quid? 10 of them. To make 1,000 quid? 100 of them. To make 10,000 quid? 1,000 of them. That's kind of easy. Don't you think? A gigging artist who's what, gigging two, three nights a week? You probably sell them, aren't you? Over a year, you'll make 10 grand. You sell records when you've got a room full of people who've just seen you gig and are full of adrenaline and the buzz, and on the way out the door, they go, oh, look, they've got some CDs done. And I'm like, yeah, all right. They probably never listen to it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they might. It's a memento of the night. If you're relying on them to go home, boot up the computer, log on to the iStore, and buy your record, by the time they get home and have another glass of wine, there's other agendas at play here. Okay? <laughs> You've got to get them when they're in the room, having just seen you play, and you will sell pieces of plastic. So if you've made 10 grand from selling pieces of plastic that year, you've spent 15 grand on making it, I make that 85 grand. No, I'm wrong. I make that 8.5 grand. Phew, that was close. You see, I'm not a businessman. That's 8.5 grand. What did you make on the other deal? 5k? You've done better already. No, I have to pay tax. <laughs> yeah, you pay tax. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Is it 8,700? So. Ladies and gentlemen, my new accountant. <laughs> <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, my new new accountant. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to show you one of the first little pieces of, of stuff that I collect to annoy, irritate and depress, and it's this. And this should remain in our minds as we go through our discussion. This is a very interesting chart, it might be a little out of date, but it's an extremely interesting chart on how much music artists earn online. And for a solo artist to earn the US monthly minimum wage of $1,160, what's that in squids? Okay. A self-pressed CD, you have to sell 143 a month. A CD baby, CD album, 155. A retail album, high-end royalty deal, 1,161. An album download, 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 1,229. An MP3 download, 1,562. 
it keeps going on until we get to what we as artists are told is the artist's new best friend, which is the streaming services. And at the bottom we have Spotify. <laughs> As a consumer, I love Spotify. Brilliant. I pay £10 a month for my premium account. It's fabulous. As an artist, I hate it. Many of you probably feel the same. No one here from Spotify. <laughs> he asked maybe a sentence or two too late. <laughs> you never know who's going to turn up in front of you with these things. I once did a guitar class and sitting at the back I suddenly realised there was a guitar hero from my, my boyhood and I just went, what the hell are you doing here? What am I supposed to teach you? 4,549,020, oh I'm glad they factored in the 20, plays on Spotify. Wow. That's scary. What conclusion do you think we should draw from this? Don't put your songs on Spotify. Don't put your songs on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> Sell your own advice. You don't expect to make money from Spotify. Sorry? You don't expect to make money from Spotify. You don't expect to make money from Spotify. Can we broaden this out? It's about multi... Sorry, sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. What was that? You shouldn't expect to make money from Spotify. You shouldn't... Mm. There's one word you're missing from that. What was your point? Uh, not it's, money. What do they call it? Multiple income streams? Multiple uh, income. Other areas. Um, yes, the buzzword is portfolio career. Right. <laughs> you're right, but I would insert the word recorded in the sentence that you offered us, which is you shouldn't expect to make money from recorded music. That's right. Okay, what should you expect to make money from? Uh, YouTube is pretty good. Is it? Yeah. yeah, I get a few hits on YouTube. I think I can afford a Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, recently, there was recently a, a meetup of YouTube musicians. And there's this there's artist that none of you have heard of in this room. Who's the boy in Essex? There's a young lad in Essex. Must have one. There's, but there's a lot more. There's a lot but more you've got more. a hit. Hundreds of thousands, aren't you? Yeah. 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 you know, there's, there's a, there's a, you'd be surprised how many of them are around. Okay, but how do you hit those figures? Three million plays on YouTube in the UK alone, and they've got to be UK hits and we'll get you fifty pounds for a PRS. <laughs> yeah, but hold on. There's other forms of revenue. There's other forms of revenue. There's advertising revenue. No, that's a very useful, in, in, interesting statement, and I might consider discussing the matter with my PRS representative as to why that figure is so low. I guess part of the rationale is this. When you broadcast on radio and TV, you're broadcasting to potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of people, but a stream is to one person. So they divide it accordingly. I suppose that's the rationale. <coughs> Look at that sea of not very smiling happy faces. <laughs> okay, let's maybe turn to slightly more positive matters. And let's see if we can perhaps move into some discussions of, of new business models. That might give us some ideas and some interesting ways forward. Shall I? I'll, I'll hide the chart of gloom, shall I? There, it's gone. The portfolio career is a very good point, and this is nothing new for musicians. How did Mozart earn his money? Commissions. And he was the court teacher. He taught the Duke's children to play the harpsichord, yeah. and he wrote 12 gavottes for the Christmas ball, and he was commissioned to do stuff, and in the evening he sat down and he did his art. Yeah. There's nothing new about this at all. It's been on musicians' agendas for millennia. And it's coming back to that. Here's an interesting thing, right? <coughs> we talked earlier about how long the music business has existed. If that's the timeline of the music business from the start of it till now, do I have a nib narrow enough to draw the blip that was the last, what, 60 years of recorded music on that timeline? 
No. The tiniest, thinnest line is somewhere around there. And it's dying. <laughs> it's going back to what it always was. The tools are different, the technology is different, the principles are the same. And the era in which you could make millions of dollars because you could sell pieces of plastic with your music on them are gone. It's gone. Even major label employees say it's over. Any major label employees in the room? <laughs> okay. There are two things to bear in mind as we go through this. To me, there are two kinds of new business models emerging. Type number one is the kind of business model that attempts to plug the hole in the sinking ship. And record labels are coming up with great new ideas to try and salvage, I suppose, their expense accounts and their annual sales conferences in Rio and all the other stuff, the gravy train they've ridden for so long. And it's quite interesting what a lot of them are doing. One of their most popular <coughs> new business models that come from the trying to plug the hole in the sinking ship model is the 360 degree deal. Do we know about 360 degree deals? Yes. Do some of you want a quick? Yes. yes. Okay. 360 degree deal. You used to get income from recordings. Well, you still do. Income from live, income from publishing, income from merchandise. Your recording income only was handled by your record company. Your live income was only handled by your live agent. Your merchandising was only handled by your merchandising. Your publishing was only handled by your publishing company. And the received wisdom was you found yourself a manager who got you a record deal. You held off on the publishing deal because the higher the advance you could get for the record deal, the higher your publishing advance would be. And the 100K that we watched disappear down the drain a few minutes ago would be made up for by a publishing advance which you would live off. That's how it worked. Record companies started to have to think carefully because, amongst many other reasons, people stopped buying pieces of plastic with a hole in the middle and they started buying streams of zeros and ones. And instead of buying a piece of plastic with ten songs on it to get to the two songs they liked, they only had to buy the two strings of zeros and ones. So instead of 10 quid going through the record company, only two quid went through the record company. The amount of money that flowed through the record labels was cut by a factor of five. It was a fifth of what they used to earn. There's one advantage to that for record labels. What's that? Right. You don't have to make pieces of plastic and put it in lorries. This is good. You make one digital file and you upload it to whoever's going to sell it on your behalf. But you still really slashed your income by a significant factor. How are we going to make up for this? I know I've had a great idea. Let's say to our artists, right. We'd like a piece of your live income, a piece of your publishing income, a piece of your merchandising income. Yes or no? Come on, you've got five minutes. If you're a new artist and you've just walked in to a room with me, a major record label, and I've said to you, 360 or nothing, come on, five seconds. I've got 500 other artists outside the door. You going to do it or not? Yes. You're going to do it. What about if you're an established artist? No. My favourite story of 360 deals is when Madonna's contract with Warner's ran out and they said, Madge, Your Honour, <laughs> time for a new deal. We'd, um, um, we'd like to offer you a 360. She went, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll go and do one with Live Nation. Bye. <laughs> and off she went because she didn't need a record company anymore. So the 360 deal was supposed to give the record company a bit of everything. 
There are various answers to it, like, well, what the hell do you know about publishing? What the hell do you know about live work and merchandising? To which the record company said, if we hadn't lent you the 100 grand to make the record in the first place, you wouldn't be out playing live, you wouldn't have any publishing income, and you wouldn't have any merchandising sales. Yes or no? Yes, but you wouldn't be playing the O2. Right. Those were the arguments that were presented. That's the way it was. That's plugging a hole in a sinking ship. As far as the other kind of new business model that labels are looking at, there's one other that I think it will be actually quite successful and will save them. It was announced this week that Universal have entered the label services arena. And what they do is this. They say, we're not going to bother making pieces of plastic anymore. 